Well, welcome everyone to Standing Room Only Talk that Center for Humanities in the Public Sphere is very excited to be giving as part of its speaker series, Scales of Belonging. My name is Jamie Alberg, and I'm the Rothman Chair and Director of the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere here in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at University of Florida. Um, before we get started with our programming, I just want to mention a new opportunity that the Center is going to be making available that should be of particular interest to undergraduate students. It's the Alexander Grass Scholars Undergraduate Research Program in the Humanities. We're going to be giving $2,000 each to 20 undergraduates to do project-based research experiences over the summer and then independent research in the fall. We're going to be working with community partners like the Matheson Museum, the Aquin Jones Museum, the Harn Museum of Art, and the UF Libraries. So there are little cards on that front table with QR codes. You can click and take a look and see how to apply and learn more about this program. We're super excited to be offering to all of you. So this academic year, our speaker series has been supported and co-sponsored by a number of generous donors and other units on campus. So I'd like to begin by recognizing them. The Margaret and Robert Rothman Endowment, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Bob Graham Center for Public Service, the Center for Arts, Migration and Entrepreneurship, the African American Studies Program, the Departments of Anthropology, History, Political Science and Geography, Smathers Libraries and UF Research. I would also like to thank the center staff that worked so hard to make these events so successful. I'll just point them out to you now. There's Sarah Agnelli, our <laughs> Assistant Director of Graduate Engagement. We have Noah Mullins and Allison Walsh, our Program Coordinator and Program Manager, and Rhonda Black, our Office Manager. So thank you to all of them and to our undergraduates through the Humanities Engagement Scholars Program who helped set out cookies and get water and things like that. So thank you to all of them for helping to make this so successful. We are going to be live streaming and recording this event. So please keep that in mind. And we welcome, of course, anyone who's joining us remotely via Zoom or YouTube today. Uh, we're so glad that you can join us as well. So we are certainly in for a treat today with the second distinguished le lecturer in our speaker series, Professor Leonard Moore, coming to us from UT Austin, where our first speaker, Depesh Chakrabarty, invited us to think about the place of the human being in a planetary ethic. Today, we're going to be thinking about belonging in terms of our own campus community, and in particular, how the issues of race, athletics, and education intersect on campus. Professor Moore is going to be introduced by UF's very own Jeff Adler, professor from the Department of History, and I'll just say a few words about Jeff to get us started. His research intersects with urban history, the history of American violence and criminal justice, and the history of American race relations. He received his PhD from Harvard University and currently offers courses on the American city, race and criminal justice, the History of Crime and Criminal Justice and Violence in America. He's received research grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEH, and the ACLS. And he has published articles on crime and violence in history, criminology and sociology journals, and in law reviews. His most recent books have explored violence and policing in American cities, including First in Violence, Deepest in Dirt, Homicide in Chicago, 1875 to 1920, Murder in New Orleans, The Creation of Jim Crow Policing, and in a brand new book for 2024, Blue Coated Terror, Jim Crow and the Roots of Modern Police Brutality. So please help me in welcoming Jeff Adler. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm delighted this afternoon to uh, introduce the distinguished historian of, of race and American politics, Leonard Moore. As a kind of peculiar personal note, I should say that Leonard and I have known each other and worked together for more than 25 years 
and 10 minutes ago was the first time I ever met him face to face. Um, he was born and raised in Cleveland and received his undergraduate degree from Jackson State University and his PhD from Ohio State University. He is the George Littlefield Professor of American History at the University of Texas, Austin. Very early in his career, uh, Dr. Moore quickly established himself as one of the nation's leading scholars of race and politics in 20th century America. His first book, Carl Stokes and the Rise of Black Political Power in America, examined the, the election of the first African-American elected to be the mayor of a major American city. Um, and his subsequent books have redefined the scholarly landscape on race in America with pathbreaking studies of police brutality from Pearl Harbor to Hurricane Katrina um, entitled Black Rage in New Orleans and in um, African-American political power during the 1970s in a book entitled The Defeat of Black Power. Dr. Moore is a remarkably accomplished teacher and his classes at the University of Texas, and I confess that this boggles my mind, regularly enroll more than 1,000 students per course. Not surprisingly, he, as, as you'll, you'll discover in a few minutes, um, he has won numerous teaching awards, including being selected as one of the, the top 10 university professors in the state of Texas, and uh, garnering the 2020 Holler and Stryker Award for creative um, student engagement. Dr. Moore's commitment to students and to higher education have taken many forms, among them leading study abro abroad programs in South Africa and in China. His efforts to encourage diversity and social justice have been similarly diverse and equally impressive. He serves, for example, as the Senior Associate Vice President for the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement at UT Austin, and as the Chairman of the Board of the Austin, Texas Area uh, Urban League. Especially during the last six, 10 years or so, his work has engaged even broader audiences and embraced an even more uh, explicitly public facing approach to race and culture and politics in modern America. And, and as a consequence, he shared his ideas and extended his influence far beyond the ivory tower and far beyond the college classroom at a time when many elected officials, tell me if this sounds familiar to you, and even university administrators implore instructors to avoid sensitive topics, to refrain from introducing complex issues in the classroom, and to sidestep potentially controversial themes. In our courses, Dr. Moore has taken a different tack in his approach to learning, teaching, and civic engagement. Always respectful, I think, and, and in constructive ways, he encourages students and the wider public to explore some of the most radioactive political and educational issues. And um, it explored all of the themes, or not all the themes, but many of the themes that some political leaders urge us, implore us, attempt to uh, use the legal system to prevent us from doing. And nowhere is this approach to learning, to thinking, to engaging important ideas in, in, in the public sphere, nowhere is this more engaging, I think, uh, or obvious, or more powerful than in his recent book, Teaching Black History to White People, which demonstrates unmistakably the need and the importance and the immense value for our civic culture 
of examining and discussing African American history and engaging with people with whom we might disagree. Please join me in welcoming Leonard Moore, whose talk today is entitled Name, Image, and Blackness, Race and College Football. Great, thank you. I wanna thank David. Uh, he wrote uh, one of my tenure letters back in 2003 at LSU, and then when I went to Texas, he wrote one over there, 2009, 2010. So David, thank you. I also wanna say, uh, Professor Alberg, thank you for inviting me. Y'all are very organized. I think they sent the invite a year ago. Um, glad to be here. Uh, Dave Cantor, uh, Director of Black Studies. Appreciate the work you do. Uh, I'm also good friend, Drew Brown there. Um, you know, you all got some great opportunities. And as I'll talk about in a minute, you know, when I was at LSU, we really built up the infrastructure, the academic infrastructure for the football team through the Black Studies program. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, this is not a formal presentation. I'm not gonna read anything to you. Um, I got some slides and I wanna just run through some ideas. So just playing around with a new project on college football. And for me, um, although this, you know, we're, we're largely focused on, you know, black athletes at predominantly white universities. You see a picture there. Understand I'm well aware that there's, there's always been a vibrant culture of black college football going back to the 1880s and 1890s. And I think I went to the best uh, undergraduate school in the nation, Jackson State University, and no Deion Sanders didn't bring anything there, all right? We gave Deion a coaching identity, and that is a, a scene from a game where we, we, we routinely would put 50,000 people in the stands at Jackson State University for, for a football game. So the story for me, this story for me kind of starts, uh, starts at Jackson State. And I remind people, the only reason I went to grad school, me and two friends were playing Madden one night, Dave. It was the spring of 1993. Two in the morning, three of us were playing, and if you lost, you had to give up the joystick, okay? And so I beat my friend. It's two in the morning. Me and my other boy are playing. My other friend pulls out his backpack and starts filling out some paperwork. And I'm like, man, what are you doing? He said, man, I'm about to apply to grad school. And I said, what's that? Now, mind you, I had an aunt with a PhD from Michigan and another aunt with a PhD from USC, but I was so out of it academically. Then something hit me. I said, well, I know I'm smarter than him. And so the next day, I applied to grad school, all right, and, and managed to get in. So my first job as a professor was at uh, Louisiana State University. It was at Louisiana State University. Got there in the uh, fall of 1998. And before I went there, I knew I wanted to get a job as a professor where I could impact that population. That was very, very important to me. Did a lot of mentoring with young men and young women when I was at Ohio State in grad school. And what I realized when I would have them to the house or mentoring, or tutoring, I began to understand that their world was a lot different behind the scenes than what we saw on Saturday, all right? So I knew that a professor could impact that population. And so when I went to LSU at the time, it was a thug out culture. And me and a friend put together an infrastructure Black faculty using African-American studies, because the one thing I would ask the coach at LSU, who do these young men have to talk to outside of the athletic bubble? And it was always quiet. Got tons of staff people, tons of coaches, don't even know their names, right? But who do they talk to when they're having an issue and they don't want to go to their coach or support staff member? So we had something for six or seven years at LSU. It was so dynamic. And it was so dynamic that the New York Times did a story on it. And I don't know about you, but whenever you know you finally gonna be in a newspaper, you get really excited. So the New York Times guy came to LSU before the, before the national championship game, interviewed me, two of my players. And I'm like, man, they may run it, they may not. I got an email at four in the morning from the university president, Mark Emmert, who was last president in NCAA. He said, Leonard, man, I enjoyed your article. New York Times, I drove to 10 grocery stores in Baton Rouge and grabbed every copy of the New York Times that I could. Not only was the story in the New York Times, it was on the front page of the Sunday edition of the Times. And it was just talking about the work we did as faculty members, all right, impacting that population. So as a result of that, you all appreciate this next slide. Um, <laughs> As a result of what went on at LSU, I kind of went on this consulting circuit, okay? And I would say the University of Georgia 
hired me. I flew up there once a month for 16 months. And what I told him, I said, it's not coaching. It's not talent. You all do not have an infrastructure outside of athletics that helps these folks. And so we put a structure in place. And I remember talking to the athletic director. I said, I got a strategy we can put together, but it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be super black. And I just want you to, to, to talk it over with your donors. Make sure they're okay with that. So he left the room, went and made some phone calls. He said, Dr. Moore, we good, all right? And the infrastructure we put in place is what Kirby Smart walked into when Mark Rick left. And again, it wasn't coaching. It wasn't talent. It's the stuff that most coaches don't think about. It's a structure off the field that involves mentoring. It involves getting the community engaged. It involves connecting these young men with black male professionals in the metropolitan area. And so they went all in, and I tell people all the time that Kirby Smart owes me a love offering or something like that, all right? Let's keep going. So now, I have a son. Been doing a lot with college athletes over the last 20, 22 years. So my son starts to grow up a little bit. Uh, he plays cornerback, and people tell me, He's good, but you know, we try to mac, minimize, ex, mac, uh, you know, have set realistic expectations. So I remember I took him to a guy he was working out with. I say, man, if we can get him to Rice or Howard to play football, we're going to be good. I'm just trying to find somebody to pay for it. All right. He said, no, Dr. Moore, he's going to be better than that. So he'll be at Notre Dame in the fall. All right. We drop him off the first of June. But now it's interesting being on the professor side for so long and then being on the parent side, right? And so we would go on these recruiting visits, and I noticed that when I talked to other parents, the sales pitch me and my wife got was often different than everybody else. And they said, yeah, Doc, they know who you are before you get on campus, all right? But it has just been interesting being a part of that infinite, this recruiting engine. And so seeing it in my house, I, can, I know what it's like going to visit a school, and my son walks on the field, and the first thing a coach says is not how you doing. He wants my son to hold his hand up to see how big his hands are. And when that happens multiple places, it's like, what are we doing? And none of, when none of the conversations during the recruiting visit re revolve around academics, it's the facilities and the shoes. And it's like, what are we doing? And I remember asking one school, I said, man, why was the academic presentation only 15 minutes? He said, because Dr. Moore, they wanted to get y'all out on the field to observe practice. And so seeing this from a parental perspective, you know, it has inspired me to look into this stuff a bit more. So I'm playing around with this book and the book essentially deals with these two photographs. What you see on the left is the the last all-white national championship team in the NCAA, that's the University of Texas, 1970. One brother, number 67, but he, was, he couldn't play as a freshman. The team was all-white. And then you look at the picture next to it. It is the recent 2024 signing class of the University of Texas. Two white guys. And, when I, and I know when I have conversations with people about this, it's like, it's taboo. You can't talk about it. And it's like in any other area of academic life, we would question the overrepresentation. And I tell people at my institution, we are four and a half percent black in the classroom, 90% black on the football field. And 80% black men's basketball, about 80% women's basketball, but nobody questions it. And when I ask my neighbors, I got some good neighbors. They're all, they're all super hard, hardcore conservatives. And when we talk about this stuff, I said, hey, man, how come white guys aren't getting scholarships? How come your son, no matter how good he is, will never get a scholarship to play in the SEC? And it's because of the stereotypes. There's this idea that the black athlete is barbaric, animalistic. He wants it more. Some of the stuff Deion Sanders is saying, oh, I said, you know, I want my D lineman to come from a single parent home. All these stereotypes. But the flip side of the stereotype is that if we want to be competitive, 
We got to have all black guys. And I asked my students the other day, I teach a big class on college football. I said, where are all the white guys? They said, Dr. Moore, Notre Dame has a ball. All right? I was at the Supreme Court about 10 years ago when the University of Texas, for the second time, had to defend the use of race in college admissions. Sitting on the second row, Clarence Thomas was about 10 feet away from me, all right? And I said, and, and I look, I said, it's funny how if we were overrepresented in the law school, in the med school, on the faculty, in the college of business, people would file multiple lawsuits immediately. But the overrepresentation in big time college football, nobody says anything. And we are soon going to be in a situation at Texas and Florida, because I didn't look at your numbers. Where we used to, where the brothers used to say, yeah, Dr. Moore, man, they stereotype me. They think I'm on a football team, but I'm not. Pretty soon, one of every two black males on a lot of these Power Five college campuses are going to be there as a result of the football enterprise. Right? And so I'm um, just looking at these issues. So when we talk about race in college football, I want to go back just for a little bit. When college football first gets its start, when it begins to take off in the South, the early 1900s, of course, there'd be no black players to the 1950s and 60s. And typically the only place you would see an African-American uh, would be as a mascot. And this here is an article, that was Auburn's mascot. They used Negroes for mascots. And every Southern school pretty much had one. And this was Auburn. You can read the article, Auburn's Negro mascot shipped back to the school. I think they played somewhere and they said he had to stay at a Negro boarding house and he overslept. So they shipped him back to, so some, uh, some uh, uh, alum shipped him back to Auburn. But it gets even more interesting. Blind Jim Ivey, a black man, was the caricature for Johnny Reb, the old Miss mascot. And they said the University of Georgia attempted to have a black mascot as well. But the founder of their football program had a connection to Yale. They said, well, let's just call name them the Bulldogs. But this seemed to be popular. So if you went to a game at Texas or LSU or Ole Miss, back in the early 1900s, black folks couldn't go to the game. The only black person you would see would be the Negro mascot. Right? Now, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You've watched an Alabama game over the last 10 years, you understand that there's a black man who is always behind Nick Saban holding a cup of Gatorade. And then you see the picture where he's, he's using a man's back to sign an autograph. Maybe this is the new version of the, of the Negro mascot, all right? 1950s, Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant, the, 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 the great Southern luminary, all right? Alabama wins its first national championship in 1961. First one in 20 years, and it solidifies in many ways how Southern politicians and boosters wanted to use college football to, in many ways, improve the image of the South. They said, well, we, no, let's, let's, let's put our money into college football. Let's put an emphasis there, and that we will be able to kind of change the image of the South. And they felt that winning football programs would allow them to maintain segregation. This is what they talked about. We'll be looked at differently, and understand this is in the midst of the uh, civil rights massive resistive move, move, movement. George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. Bull Connor and the German Shepherds and the fire hoses. And of course, the 16th Street bombing where those four little girls died getting ready for morning worship service. So in the midst of that, the state of Alabama and Southerners are beginning to promote this football team. And what Alabama football does, it gives white Southerners four things. Number one, it gives them achievement, a sense of legitimacy, something to be proud of, and it allows them to, uh, it gives them a level of respect. There's a great book called Rammer Jammer Yellow Hammer, written by an Alabama fan. He talks about he went to NYU, and he had a picture of Bear Bryant on his wall. His roommate asked him, is that your grandfather? 
He said, no, he said, he said, it's the football coach. And he said, why would you have a picture of a football coach on your wall? A few weeks ago, when Kalen DeBoer got hired at Alabama, I saw the most, I knew this thing was out of control then. He gets hired from Washington. I don't know why he leave Washington to go to Alabama, but he did. And they were covering it. And a couple thousand fans went to the airport to greet the coach. And I'm just trying to think how the conversation would go in my house. Well, wifey, I'll be back. Where are you going? I'm going to the airport. For what? To meet the new football coach. Well, are you going to meet him? No, I'm not going to meet him. I'm going to just wave to him. <laughs> but folks, this stuff is insane. It defies logic. It makes no sense. I live 80 miles away from where Jimbo Fisher just got the greatest buyout in the history of college football. They gave him $75 million to go home. And the athletic director who gave them the contract just got hired at Ohio State to be athletic director. So the whole Bear Bryant priest, and what is it about Bear Bryant? Because you had other coaches in the South. Bud Wilkinson in Oklahoma wins three national championships. Daryl K. Royal wins three at Texas. What is it about Bryant? Several things. Number one, he is one of them. He's a country boy. He is from Morrow Bottom, Arkansas. Anybody heard of Morrow Bottom before? I have no desire to go there, all right? He utilizes undersized country boys. He praises the communities that produce these boys. He represents older white Southern values. He's a taskmaster. You saw the movie Junction Boys. And so Bear Bryant, in many ways, is a symbol of Southern pride. One thing I've been trying to figure out over the last 20-something years was this slogan, it just means more. Now, I'm a diehard Ohio State guy. I cheer for two teams, Jackson State, Ohio State, and I'm going to cheer for the Fighting Irish because they're paying that tuition pretty soon, all right? You will never hear me in the stands doing Big Ten chants. I'm an Ohio State fan. And so I remember, you know, you go to SEC, they're chanting SEC, SEC, sort of this regional identity, right? As if they are refighting the Civil War. T-shirts that say SEC, it just means more. Their own network. And so the question is, what is it about college football in the South? One man told his daughter, you may have heard the story before he told his daughter, she said she announced her engagement, and he said, I'm telling you right now, do not do not schedule your wedding in the fall on a Saturday. He said, don't put me in that position. She put him in that position. <laughs> he didn't go to the wedding, all right? But so one scholar identifies six or seven reasons why college football means more in the South, and it does. And I live in Texas, all right? where the high school football is insane. Me and my wife, we first moved there. A kid who was a, a young woman who was uh, babysitting our kids with cheerleader. And I say, hey, let's go to the football game tonight because so-and-so is cheering. So we buy the tickets. We walk in, we sit down. Five minutes later, somebody says, well, sir, do you have, are, are these your seats? I said, well, we paid money for them. She said, well, sorry, sir, these are for season ticket holders only. I said, for a high school game? She said, yes, uh, all the seats between the 40s are season ticket holders. I said, damn, this is something else. So it's this idea, he says, number one, the, the, the legacy of violence in the South. We love seeing somebody get knocked out in college football, don't we? We love seeing somebody get knocked out. The legacy of violence. He also says, the system of honor. One of the most, the biggest insults a football team can get is when somebody says, it's when an opposing team is just running the ball down your team's throat, right? Can't stop it. They say our men look soft. They quit. They didn't represent the university like they should. So this idea of the system of honor. He also talks about this Civil War defeat. In addition, you have no college sports in the South. College football gives the South something to brag about because they couldn't compete with their Northern peers academically. And then it says that it gives the uneducated person a connection to the university. 
Bryant takes us to another level. In the 1960s, you will find college football programs beginning to integrate. And there was no great day of integration. It happened Oklahoma 1957, the University of Texas 1970. It was all kind of, a, depending on who the president was and the board of regents and the board of trustees. But here is one thing they didn't think about when they started bringing black athletes to the campus. They wanted their physicality, they didn't want their politics. And when you see black athletes show up to the campus in the late 60s and early 70s, they begin to register a number of complaints which, if we took a poll today, the complaints may be the same, may be slightly different. They said they were not allowed to make out their own academic schedules. Said they were steered toward easy classes. There were no black people in athletic department leadership. Said they were isolated on campus, no black coaches. Said there were restrictions on hairstyles, felt they were treated as gladiators, coach abuse and misconduct. And they said they were ignored when their eligibility was exhausted. I have a daughter who plays basketball at the University of North Texas, a mid-major program. I didn't say Baylor or UConn or South Carolina. I said the University of North Texas, they compete in the American Athletic Conference. Played Ford Atlantic last night, all right? They take a chartered plane to every game. Unlimited Nike gear. And the green and white Nike combo is super dope in my opinion. All right? Anything she wants, she can get. She had a health issue a couple of years ago, was having some seizures at night in her sleep. Me and my wife tried to get an appointment with a neurologist in, in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Earliest appointment was two to three months out. The University of Texas, the University of North Texas got her an appointment within 15 minutes. So the question is, when my daughter leaves the bubble, playing in nice arenas, staying in nice hotels, can eat whatever they want, how does she function? Because we know real life won't be that way. And we have made things so comfortable for student athletes because we're selfish. And I don't know if we're doing it for them or are we doing it because our here institution is doing it and we have to one up them. And so they were talking about that there, how they were ignored when their eligibility was exhausted. Many of you are familiar with this game. USC and Alabama, 1970 in Birmingham. And this game has taken, as people talk about to mythic proportions now, we don't know what's true and what's false. But what we do know is US, Bear Bryant invites USC to play in Birmingham. Alabama's all, all white. Bear Bryant wants to integrate. He says, well, maybe we play USC and maybe those black boys will tear us up and then maybe I can get some black boys on the Crimson Tide. Sam Cunningham runs for 135 yards. They said he ran all up and down Legion Field. They said after the game that Bear Bryant, disappointed they lost, but knew it was part of a larger strategy. When they lose to USC, the boosters asked Bear Bryant what happened. He said, if you all want us to be competitive, you got to let me bring black players, players in here. So after that game, Alabama would bring in black players. And throughout the 70s and 80s, the SEC would go all in on African-American talent. Last 20 years, between 1980-2000, if you ask people if college athletes should get paid, here's the responses they would come up with. The first one is the funniest to me. The money may harm them, all right? Then it would say it would diminish their love of the game, right? Secondary sports would struggle. The financial benefit is marginal. And then, then the, bureau, the, the bureaucratic argument, number seven, setting salaries can be messy. And this is what people would say. But all of these young men are filling up stadiums. And one thing you got to realize that football revenue, and in some places, basketball revenue, subsidizes the Olympic sports. I told my daughter at North Texas, I said, Jocelyn, y'all don't generate any revenue. So if you go over there to eat and the football players come, tell them thank you. <laughs> well, Daddy, I work just hard. You work just as hard as they do. You are absolutely right. But they're generating the revenue. So think about this for a minute. At Texas USC. 
swim team, golf team, tennis team, soccer team, largely upper income wealthy white kids whose scholarship is being subsidized by black boys. 18, 19, 20, 21. The revenue gets divided up amongst everybody and nobody ever talked about it. And I remember I went to, I spoke at a school in the Big Ten a couple years ago, had all the head coaches in there. I said, how many of you have ever told the kids on your team that it's a privilege for them to be there? All the hands went up. And I said, okay, put your hands down. I said, how many of you all play a power five sport? Play sport at power five level? None of the hands went up. I said, so how do you tell these kids it's a privilege for them to be there? Because when you tell me that as a black person, when you say privilege, it means I didn't earn it. And I don't think y'all are just giving scholarships away. I said, if you get fired from, it was Purdue. If you get fired from Purdue today, are you sure you can get another power five job? I said, so maybe it's a privilege for you to be here and not them. But craziness. It's a privilege for you to be here when they're working their butts off to be there. One of the problems, we would see things like this. By the way, this is the best game ever EA Sports ever made, all right? And my son said, Daddy, I think I'm going to be on the game. I said, pump the brakes, brother. How much money you going to get, all right? He just wants to be on the game, right? But athletes would see this stuff. Their name, image, and likeness in a video game. Weight, height, skin color. The rating, all that pretty much matched up with them. They would see their jerseys in the bookstore. And they would basically see everybody else getting rich off their labor but them. This basketball player at Wisconsin, I love it. He said, broke college athletes, anything helps. And I'm amazed to hear people say, well, I'm going to give anything. Play at Florida. Well, you're not good enough. <laughs> Well, they shouldn't complain. They got it all made. Now, understand, we call it a scholarship, but a scholarship to me is what? You go to class, you hit a certain GPA, the scholarship gets renewed. This is work study. You go to practice, you perform, the scholarship gets all those scholarships now three, three to four years, okay? So anyway, but we'll begin to see around the time of, the, and I'm getting to the meat of this, around the time of the, 2020, we begin to see now black athletes using their voice and we begin to see white Southerners putting football in front of race. Let me back up. 1955, Georgia Tech is supposed to play in a bowl game. I believe it's against, against Pitt or Penn State. Georgia Tech is excited. They accept the invitation. Then the governor of Georgia finds out that the opponent has a black player. They asked Pitt or Penn State, whichever one it was, can you leave your black player at home? They say no. And the Georgia governor says, we are not going to play in the bowl game. The students from Emory, Georgia, and Georgia Tech have a near riot in front of the governor's house in Atlanta because they want to play the game. And somebody asked the kid, said, well, do you care about integration? And the best quote was, he said, football is more important than segregation. And so Kylan Hill, running back Mississippi State, sends out a tweet and it says, either change the flag or I won't be representing this state anymore. And I mean that I'm tired. Having gone to Jackson State, it was a 30-year fight to have this discussion. But when he brings it up, he gets the support of Mike Leach at Mississippi State. He gets the support of the head coach at Ole Miss. He gets the support of the head coach at Southern Miss. And a year later, guess what happens? The Republican-dominated Mississippi State Legislature puts it as a special election, and before you know it, the flag is changed. We're putting... Football in front of our politics. Summer 2020, University of Alabama players protesting, using their voice. 
And at the front of this march was Nick Saban. Oklahoma football team said they weren't going to practice. And they have their coach out front. And the coach at Clemson, what's his name again? Dabo Sweeney was critical of Black Lives Matter. But three days later, he's apologizing and leading a march on behalf of his players because they understand where the bread is buttered. Now, this is interesting because when Black Lives Matter takes off and these athletes start protesting, at the same time, you have legislation coming out of California around name, image, and likeness. And typically, when you see the big reforms in college athletics, it is not that people in Texas and Florida or Louisiana or Georgia want to do that. They understand if California does it first, the California schools will have a recruiting advantage. So guess what? We have to do something as well. The University of Missouri has, I mean, Missouri has an NIL program. It says if you commit to an in-state school, you can get name, image, and likeness money as a high school student. You see the young men using their voice here and young women using their voice during the summer of 2020. And then we get name, image, and likeness compensation passed. Well, now young men and women can use their likeness. They can get an endorsement deal, right? And for the first time, you're beginning to see these young men uh, receiving the fruits of their labor. I know what it's like when I see young men I teach leave my class in a $275,000 Lamborghini. <laughs> but I'm not jealous because I know what they put in to get it, and I know they, they are worth more than that. But here's what's interesting about this. Ryan Day, he made it public. He said he would need $13 million for his salary, for his payroll. Now, mind you, 10 years prior, they don't deserve anything. Their education is enough. But now when Urban Meyer says this, and he says, if you want us to be competitive with Alabama and Georgia and Texas, this is the minimum I will need. You know he got that money in 72 hours? 72 hours. And now every university has what we call a collective. Uh, Florida has one. And, 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 they, and again, their appeal when they raise money is that if you want us to be competitive, if you want us to be competitive, we need y'all to donate because we need to pay these young men. And I love every bit of it. Another piece of legislation that's very interesting, this whole thing about the unlimited transfers. And as an academic, I am torn with this. When my daughter got in the transfer portal, I thought I was on top of it. All right, she left Incarnate Word, a small D1 Catholic school in San Antonio. They won the conference championship. She led the conference in scoring. She said, Daddy, I want to get in the portal. I said, what are you trying to get? She said, I'm trying to get Power 5. Ah, you ain't good enough for Power 5. Let's go maybe one step up. So North Texas reached out to her, Wichita State, Washington State. And I said, first of all, I told the coach, first of all, I want you to look at her transcript and let me know where all the credits, credits transfer. That's, that's number one before we have any other discussion. That's number one. I was on top of that. So they accepted all the credit hours. She signs with UNT. Then a friend of mine asked, he said, Leonard, did you find out what their residency requirements were? Wow, never thought about that. What do I mean resident, residency requirements? You can't go to Florida for three years or, or seven semesters and transfer to Harvard for your eighth semester and get a degree from Harvard. Most schools say you got to do 45 hours or 60 hours in residence. We have young men transferring. Although they have the credit hours, guess what? They don't have the hours in residence to get a degree. And the problem is nobody's telling them. I don't expect coaches to tell them because coaches don't know. Now, there's some meat here. I want to chew on this bone for a little bit. Most of my conservative friends in my neighborhood would tell you, literally, it needs to be about merit. We don't need race and admissions anymore. Don't need anymore, right? And when I asked them this, I said, how about we do this? If we want to go the merit route, how about 
We have one admissions process for everybody. No exceptions for artists, no exceptions for athletes, and no exceptions for alumni kids. To me, that would be fair. I told the folks at Texas, we got 7,500 slots in the freshman class. Take the top 7,500 SAT scores and call it a day. Nobody likes that idea. Because we have no problem lowering the bar for an athlete. But we have a problem lowering the bar from somebody from the inner city or poor white kid from West Texas or Latino kid from the RGB. How come nobody sees that as hypocritical? Nobody, nobody, no, nobody agrees with that. Nobody says that's reverse discrimination. Nobody says, well, I would have gotten in if you didn't let, if you didn't let the basketball player in. If you let the football player in. And the reason we don't question it is because black athletes serve a purpose for us. Good friend of mine, Scotty Graham, uh, he coached running backs at Arizona last year. I'm not sure. He, I think he just took a job somewhere else. Played football in Ohio State. His last year got a master's degree in black studies. Didn't get drafted. He applied to the PhD program in sociology at Ohio State. They didn't admit him because they said his GRE scores were too low. He said, well, when I came out of high school in New Jersey, my SAT scores were low, but you didn't have a problem with it. And so let me give you a scenario. A kid from two kids from New Orleans, cousins, grow up together. One is an African-American female, wants to major in engineering, gets a 1350 on her SAT. Applies to Michigan, Duke, Texas, USC, gets denied by all of them. Her cousin, a 6'3 cornerback, 940 on the SAT, never study. Gets a scholarship offer from Michigan, Duke, USC. What do we tell her? And what do you tell him when the smartest person he knows applied to the school but didn't get in? But he did. And so one of the things I'm grappling with, and I think this slide tells it all, wait, you two can stay. And it is one of the most hypocritical things I have ever seen. It is if we have carved out a space, particularly for black men at the research university and told them, this is the space for you. And I am just waiting for somebody to file a lawsuit. Yeah, no, my son is a good student. He ain't had no 15 feet to get Notre Dame. Great student, though. But the point is, how come nobody questions this? And also, when we see the overrepresentation in men's and women's basketball and football, it's as if you can't talk about it. Like, when I took students to China for the first time, we're in this orientation. I don't know if it was the Communist Party doing it. I don't know who did the orientation. They said, while you're here, don't mention three things. Don't mention Taiwan, <laughs> don't mention voting, and don't mention democracy. <laughs> Got you, okay? But everybody sees it. But nobody wants to talk about it. So I'm a firm believer in doing something about it. So several years ago, I created something just out of my own called the Black Student Athlete Summit. We had it at the University of Texas for the first year, 2016 had 70 people. Last year we had, our seventh year, we had over 1,500 people at the University of Southern California. And the summit is designed to help these young men and women transfer, uh, transition out. Because there's a phrase called identity foreclosure that every athlete goes through. 
friend of mine, a white, uh, white girl played soccer at Temple. I said, you know, when did you know your soccer career was over? She said, Dr. Moore, we lost in our tournament uh, conference. We, we weren't going to the NCAA tournament. We lost in our, our, turn, our conference tournament. She said, the coach came in before we got dressed. He said, okay, good season, blah, blah, blah. He left. She said, at the airport, he calls him in a circle and he says, all right, y'all, for the girls who are returning, two weeks off, and I just sent you your workout, your all-season workout schedule. She said when she looked at her phone and she didn't get the, the message, she said she bust out crying. She said, Dr. Moore, I've been playing soccer since I was six and 21, it's over. Take the kid who plays wide receiver at the University of Florida, who's been popular his whole life. What happens when this is over? If he gets a degree, what happens to his identity? Do you, you ever been to a Florida game, pregame? Where those young men get off the bus? You ever seen that? Y'all super nerd. Y'all want to go to games here? Ben, you travel with the team. Sometimes when I would do it with Texas, I felt like I was playing. A police escort from the hotel to the campus? Thousands of people greeting you as you walk into the stadium? and 100,000 people cheering for you at the game, millions more watching on TV. Me and my son were on a plane, coming back from Notre Dame weekend. He, my son had no Notre Dame game on. He said, are you Leonard Moore? So what happens when that's over? And so we created this summit to help with those issues. And people have looked at me crazy for 26 years because as a black professor, I'm supposed to be all rah-rah. But I tell head coaches, athletic directors, when you all are done with them, they come back to the black community. And let me talk about women's basketball for a minute and I'm almost done, all right? I was at a Big East school speaking for Black History Month prior to a women's basketball game. And they said, Dr. Moore, you wanna come back and meet the young ladies? And I went and met them. And I said, y'all should fire that coach because she doesn't care about how these young women present themselves, and she doesn't care about them after basketball. I can tell, but we gonna go cheer, and we gonna clap. And when their eligibility is up, guess what? We got four more young women coming in, and we gonna cheer and clap for them. So again, this is just trying to look at, you know, broadly college football in the South. It's way out of control. And lastly, I'm amazed at tech, the, the stuff I see in Texas. They will post, uh, somebody in Texas will post a picture of a half-empty UCLA game at the Rose Bowl. And we laugh at them. Like, how could they not go to a football game? Hell, because I'm in Los Angeles, that's why, all right? I got other options. And so my challenge to all of us are who are fans is let's not get caught up in the fandom. Remember, they are people. And if you cheer for them while they play, and I need you to cheer more for them when they're done. Talk to a guy who gave a, a big check to a collective. I said, I appreciate you putting it in, into the collective, but do you have any black folk who work at your firm? And so I don't know where I'm going with this, but I got a year and a half to write this book and it'll be the best book on college football you've ever read. Thank you for your time. We have about 15 minutes for questions and I think we have mic runners, right? Yeah, there they are. Okay, great. Here, I'll give this back to you when you're ready. Yes, right. Yes, right. 
Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Uh, in uh, a, few, a few, a couple years ago, like 1989, I entered the College of Health and Human Performance here. And while I, while recruiting, they applauded my proposed research, melanin and the training effect. Mm. And when I got in the program, they squashed that. Mm -hmm. But I shouldn't have been surprised because I heard administrators in that college talk openly about Ben Hill Griffin's command that there should never be a black quarterback. And that held until Chris Leak. Mm -hmm. Oh, I meant to quiz y'all people if you knew that name. But there was uh, before Tim Tebow. Got a question for us? The first black quarterback. Okay. Well, I'm suggesting that you're throwing seeds on some real hard ground here, and I hope it takes, see takes root. But how do you propose to change places where the resistance is so high? I mean, one thing I do, I, I believe in holding coaches accountable. I'm very confrontational with head coaches because I tell them, you know, at this level, you have generational wealth already. And for me, it's one thing I, I, I spoke to Final Four to 50 Division One head men's basketball coaches. And I said, you all control all the currency because you control playing time. And I said, what do you make them do that you don't benefit from? Dr. Moore, what do you mean? I said, you make them get up at 5 a.m. to work out. You benefit from that. What do you make? I said, is it either of own possibilities that you tell every kid on your team, you're going to get an internship this summer, whether you like it or not? That could happen in 10 minutes. Or tell them, if you don't show up with a resume, you're not practicing. They will get it done. Well, Dr. Moore, man, it, I know it sounds good, but I'm under so much pressure. I'm not letting you off the hook on that. I'm not letting that go. Because we got to make sure they can function when they leave here. So if I told you my daughter, they take a, a chartered plane, every, what, what's it like at the big schools? And so my, I put my onus on, on the coaches. And you can't just push kids off a cliff when the eligibility is up. What? Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Florida, we, or HBCUs in Florida, have uh, a very long history of, of black football and black players and black coaches, most notably with people like Jake Gaither at FAMU and uh, some of that Coach Gaither was always proud of was that so many of his players went on to become teachers in Florida and became very involved in building black communities throughout the state. And with you ending your talk, talking about how uh, PWI institutions often throw these black players out, I was wondering if if you have like a chronology, at least in, in places uh, like Florida, about how it went from A to B there. No, I think, you know, when when... TV got into college football in the 70s and early 80s. So I was at LSU when they hired Nick Saban. You know what his salary was? And this was national news. It was a million dollars a year. <laughs> My former uh, high school classmate, Mel Tucker, was getting $9.5 million a year at Michigan State. And he had one good season. And so to me, the, just the impact of big business and the, and, you know, uh, the economic impact of Gator football. What does that mean? If you may have heard the story, you ever heard one, win one for the Gipper, George Skip, Notre Dame player, never went to class. They said he was at the pool hall with the brothers during the daytime. He's ineligible at Notre Dame. Newt Rotney is going to, the, the university says he's ineligible. The business owners from Notre Dame, from, from South Bend, go to the president and say, we need him to play because he's good for the economy. So some of these issues are broader than the campus now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned kind of the, how your neighbors yes. uh, came to expect a certain representation among players. Yes. Uh, but I found that maybe that same expectation is not among coaches. Mm -hmm. So, do you experience the same and how do you, do you attribute that disconnect? How do you mean? Uh, so in our research, we look at players, we say, well, players are the most likely potential coaches in the future. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a really big gap, right? In representation. Right. 
And there's a lot of reasons mm -hmm. when you talk about popular, when you present this in the popular press, mm -hmm. that people will leave comments at the bottom of the page right. <laughs> about why that's the case. Right. So, but I'm curious about your, uh, if you have run into that as well, and how what, you what, uh, or the talk old representation on the field, underrepresentation in coaching. Yes, sir. You put that much better than I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, y you would think that you know the 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 best coaches would come up through the ranks. Uh, a lot of young men don't want to go into coaching because they haven't had a good experience with their coaches, and also a lot of young men don't want to go into coaching because it means that they failed as as an athlete. You know, I, I was speaking to some NFL NFL PA players a couple years ago. And I said, man, you know, and these were guys who just got cut or been cut recently. They're trying to figure out their next move. And I said, why don't you all take advantage of those programs in the summer? Wharton had a program for them, all these programs. You know what the guy said? He said, Dr. Moore, when you play in the NFL, if you start taking advantage of those programs, you're telling yourself that your career is over. And some of the talk about just dying an early death, right? But I agree, we do need to get some people off this track and get onto a coaching track, but they have, you know, a, a number of reasons why they, why they don't want to go into coaching. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. yes. mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I work with some of the student athletes here. I see them and uh, I was a parent of a student athlete in college, but t they do not have time to participate in university life mm -hmm. that prepares other university students. Oh, that's a good question. Sets Go them up for success. So how are we supposed to help them aside from maybe giving them a fifth year where they can get off the field, get off the court and just live the life of a university student, join a student org. They, ca they can't even take internships because they're training during the summer or playing. What what's the solution here? Here's what I tell coaches: said they don't have time, coach. You don't give them time. And a lot of what we see in Division One athletics is it reached the point of diminishing returns. And most coaches, I mean, you got these football and basketball facilities, which I have an issue with because it keeps them in the bubble. They don't get out. And for me, it's, you only can train so much. But they just do it because everybody else does it. And so my point is we need coaches who have more of a conscience. I mean, I mean, and we're doing stuff. We don't know it's a fact, we're just doing it because we're doing it. I mean, why can't you give them the month of June off? Why can't you say, okay, the month of June, July, we're going to practice in the afternoon. Y'all get an internship from 8 to, 12, 8 to 12 in the morning. That's 20 hours, 8, 8 to 12. That's 20 hours a week internship. That's all you need. But when they try to do other stuff and the coach keeps calling them, and some of it is about control, to be honest with you. It's about control. We, want, we need to make sure we keep our eyes on them. But how does the kid develop? You cannot keep them in the facility all day and all night. You can't. But Co Will, Will Muschamp was, was a good friend of mine, right? I remember one day, he was at Texas. I went and saw him. I said, what you doing, man? He said, I'm watching film. I said, it's February. <laughs> I said, coach, maybe if you turned off the film machine and maybe spent some time with the young men and got to know them as people, Try that way and have them explore some different things. But here's the problem. Can I see this for a minute? When, when, when I'm an athlete and this is my sport and it's like this, can't explore nothing else. And I believe when you let these kids explore other things, they may perform better on the field. Nobody has ever shown me what spring football practice does, what has to do with the fall. I, w I just want to see some data on it. I remember Steve Spurrier told somebody once, some coach said that he was in the, he was in, he was in the office at midnight. Steve Spurrier said, it doesn't seem like it's doing any good. He said, go home and get some sleep, all right? <laughs> but the problem is head coaches aren't used to being challenged. And so as a tenured professor, I thrive on confrontation. And I tell them, if you look at what we did at Georgia, it worked. 
You can't keep them corralled all the time. Had a young man at Texas, whenever he had an, he, whenever he had an issue, he drove home to Shreveport, five hours away. He would leave when practice was over, get to Shreveport 10, 11 o'clock at night, talk to somebody, talk to a family member, get back on the road at, at, at eight in the morning, come back in time for practice. That's unhealthy. He said, Doc, I had nobody to talk to. So we got to quit putting headquarters on pedestals, challenge them, and let them know they have a responsibility to help those young men be successful off the field. Right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. I actually have uh, two quick questions. Um, so, what are some of the specific coaches that you feel have set the right standard for taking care of their athletes, and kind of what was key to their mentorship? But also, um, you said you're writing your book and. Will you be touching on some of like movie influences or representation of coaches and the way that they inspired students in your book? I know that there's like movies like Coach Carter where you have like Samuel L. Jackson, who's not super inspiring. Yeah. So stuff like that. Here's one of the unfortunate parts of, of the enterprise. Coaches will tell me this, Dr. Moore, I would love to send my kids to South Africa with you for June. But if I send them and we don't have a good season, the boosters will say, should have those young men working out instead of going to South Africa. All right. Some coaches do it well. And that's why I tell every coach, maybe Florida may not be the place for you to coach at or Texas. But I think there is a way you can look at the calendar and build in things for the young men that you require them to do. We gotta quit having these career fairs where nobody shows up. It's embarrassing. Coach, make them go. Well, well. And so what I'm calling for is just a revolution in, in the coaching enterprise. The one thing I appreciate about Marcus Freeman at Notre Dame, you know what he told my son? He said, Leonard, make sure you want, you want to come to school here. He said, Notre Dame is a hard place to be. It's a boring city, and yes it is. It's boring, it's cold, it ain't sexy, no online classes, the classes are hard. But if you can do this, you can do this, you can do anything. And so how about coaches be more honest? The one thing that turned me and my son off on the recruiting process is when a coach promised playing time on the recruiting visit. You don't talk, my, my son ain't that good. <laughs> All right. All right, any more questions? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Now, my question is for coaches that of see the athletes to be uh, gladiators. Yes, sir. Type of, you know, silhouettes. Uh -huh. And then I want to ask, how do you think we can start to individualize football athletes when the whole identity of football is based off barbaric nature? Mm -hmm. And then how do you think this tendency to de-individualize these athletes uh, contributes to the understanding of black university students who used to be athletes mm -hmm. and how these uh, society v views them and how they view themselves. Check this out. So I want you to find me a former black big time athlete. You will never see them riding around with the bumper sticker where they went to school on their car. <laughs> never. Because they begin to reflect back on their experience and it's like, man, that school should have done a little bit more for me. The first part is that identity piece starts early. It starts in black football. If y'all watch the show Friday Night Tykes, my son played in that league in sixth grade. It was a mess. But the identity piece starts early. You'll have a kid playing flag football who scored five touchdowns. The pastor on Sunday may say, little Johnny, come on up here. They told him we got a future NFL player in the church. And guess what? That's where it begins to start, the identity. One of the toughest things we try to emphasize to parents is that if your kid got a scholarship, D1, D2, you've won already. You've won. You've won. Do you know how much pressure parents are putting on kids? How come you aren't playing? I told you not to go there. And they're killing kids. I don't know if we still drug test for weed, but guess what? If we drug tested for weed, a lot of kids are smoking because they're depressed. They're depressed. 
And so we have adults, man, we got to do a better job at letting them know that they are more than an athlete. And that's how you got to expose them to stuff early on. One thing we tell a lot of kids, quit wearing your team gear to class. Put on regular clothes. Put on regular clothes. It does something for your identity. And so we just got a lot, lot to do. And it's not on, all on the coaches. Some of it's on the black community and our expectations, a celebrity culture that we have. And some of it's on the parents as well. All right. Thank you, thank Dr. You Moore, so for opening these very provocative conversations. Let's thank our speaker.